ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد the topic that has been assigned to me for today is entitled perfect justice debunking the male bias myth in other words the topic is about explaining to non muslims and in our times even many muslims why is it that there are so many gender specific rules gender different rules in islam why do our women have to wear hijab and not men why is it that a man is allowed to practice polygamy and not women why is it that the inheritance is different why 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 so many questions arise from non muslims and even in our times from many muslims they're questioning the fundamentals of their religion the fundamentals of fiqh the fundamentals of usul the fundamentals of male female interactions and they're wondering why is our religion so different from what we see around us today from the environment we have been raised in and so i'm trying to explain in this talk in a nutshell our proper methodology of response how do we respond to these allegations somebody comes and tells us islam is a very chauvinistic religion it's a sexist faith it prefers men over women and they list a number of things such as polygamy such as hijab such as inheritance such as this and that witnesses in the court and they list a number of things and they say look look at this type of religion it's making women backward and it's promoting male chauvinism and making men better than women how do we respond to these allegations how do we defend our faith from these accusations now the topic that i'm talking about is very common it's very common you've heard it so many times of defending women's rights in islam in fact i might even go so far as to say that this has become a staple topic for many conventions and many speakers so much so that an average talk that is advertised with this topic in mind will not even generate a great response because it's cliche been there done that i've heard this this conversation before so let me reassure you that although the topic might indeed be very common in fact one of the most common topics at muslim conventions and gatherings let me be so bold as to state that the response you will hear today inshallah ta'ala is a very very unique response it is a response that is rarely heard it is a response that i personally believe is a much better and perfect response than the traditional than the stereotypic stereotypical response that is given to uh, this question because and i claim perhaps very boldly and i will justify this claim that the traditional methodology of responding to these allegations by traditional methodology i'm referring to answers that all of you know why is it that a woman has is allowed to have more than you know uh, a man is allowed to have more than uh, one wife and a woman isn't well because during times of war it is men who die and the women are more numerous because there's orphans because you know uh, more widowers uh, why is it that uh, you know the inheritance is uh, is more for the man versus the woman well because the man has more financial obligations than the woman so you have these you know excuse me stereotypical responses okay and i state quite boldly and i will defend this inshallah that these responses have not cannot and will not succeed in doing justice to our religion these traditional responses they will not succeed in solving this bias in solving this this perception that non muslims and unfortunately many uh, muslims who are not grounded in the religion have of our religion uh, uh, with regards to male and female interactions first though let me digress a little bit let me tell you a little bit about muslim histor historiography and about some of the clashes that muslim culture has had with other cultures this is because this is because it is not the first time in the history of the ummah where our culture our civilization our thought has come into contact with other thoughts and has been influenced for the better or for the worse by those thoughts no it has happened many times before 
We've been around 1,400 years. It's not the first time we're interacting with other civilizations. It's not the first time we're hearing concepts, we're hearing ideas that are not found in our religion, they're found in other faiths and other cultures. So let me digress and let me summarize for you one such encounter that occurred. Because the encounter when we analyze it and when we study it with other civilizations and cultures, it is the same as what is happening now. It's not the first time we've been exposed to cultures that are deemed superior to our own. One of the first encounters that the Muslims had of the past was their encounter with Greek philosophy. This occurred within the first 150 to 100 years of Islam. For the first time, Muslims got exposed to a theology that was based upon other principles, not based upon the Quran and Sunnah. And Greek mysticism and Greek theology and Greek philosophy was perceived to be, in fact it still is perceived to be, far more superior than religious philosophies. To this day, here in America, 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 years after these philosophers lived. In our undergraduate schools, we study their works. We study Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. We study the ancient Greek wisdom and how it was passed to the Romans and so on and so forth. There was no exception back then. In that, when the Muslims came across this mine of information, they were overwhelmed by what they perceived to be a superior culture, a superior thought. And so Muslims of that time reacted in various ways. You had one group amongst them who later became known as the Islamic philosophers, the philosophers of Islam. You had one group amongst them who took these ideas of Greek philosophy and they swallowed them hook, line and sinker completely. All they did was that they changed the words. Aristotle referred to God as the prime mover, the unmoved mover. For Aristotle, God was nothing other than the first cause. That was who he was. Aristotle had no concept of worship, of loving this God, of praying to him, of a God that interacts with us, that feeds us, that nourishes us. No. For Aristotle, the God was the unmoved mover, the prime mover. When these Muslims took Aristotelian philosophy, and they transferred it into Arabic, all they did was that instead of saying the prime mover, they said Allah. But the net result was the same. If you were to ask these philosophers to describe this God, this God that they had called Allah, and you look at their works, and they are still around these works. If you were to ask these Muslim philosophers, who is this being that you call Allah? Is He merciful? Is He our creator? Is He the one who provides what we need? Is he the one whom we have to worship? For the philosophers, the Muslim philosophers, the answer to all of these questions would be a resounding no. No. The Muslim philosophers did not believe that Allah created us. They said matter is eternal. God does not create matter. To this day in thermodynamics, modern thermodynamics, there is a maxim, a principle, a theorem. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Rather, it can only transfer from one form to another. And of course, the famous Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, basically you are correlating matter with energy. Is that matter and energy are correlated. There is a constant amount of energy and matter, and they cannot increase and decrease. For Muslims, no. Matter can and is created and destroyed. Allah creates it, Allah destroys it. Energy is created and destroyed. Allah creates it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can destroy it. Point being that, for Aristotle, and for the Muslim philosophers influenced by him, God was not the creator. God was not the object of worship, the object of veneration and love. No, he was some philosophical entity whom they had called the prime mover, the unmoved being, the first cause. There was no Jannah and, 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 and Nar. You were to ask the Muslim philosophers, what's going to happen in the afterlife? They would have told you, and these people claim to be Muslims, they would have told you, there is no Akhirah. These are just fables. You're not supposed to accept the Quran literally. Allah will not resurrect the dead. Allah will not have a day of judgment and, and call, call us to account. There is no such thing as a real Jannah and Nar. If you were to ask these Muslim philosophers, is God characterized by any attribute at all? Is He knowledgeable? The Muslim philosophers wrote explicitly in their works that this unmoved mover whom they called Allah, 
does not know, cannot know what man is doing. Allah does not know what we are doing right now according to the Muslim philosophers. Because they took Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotelian logic, Aristotelian cosmology, and they fell into it completely and wholeheartedly. And then they looked at the Quran and Sunnah. Well, forget the Sunnah, they rejected the Sunnah from outright. They looked at the Quran and they read in the works of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle into the Quran. They read in what they wanted to find into the Quran. Instead of approaching the Quran as a source of guidance, they approached it with preconceived notions. God cannot be the creator. So every single verse which said Allah created us, خلق السماوات والأرض, this and that, they said, aha, the unmoved mover, the prime cause. No actual creation. Every verse that challenged their presumptions of Aristotelian logic and philosophy, they reinterpreted so that it conforms with what they thought was superior to the Quran. And in fact, in their writings, they claim that the philosopher occupies a higher rank than the prophets. Because the prophets, they said, and this is literally, I'm quoting from one of their works. The name of this person is very famous, all of you know him. The philosopher, the, the, the prophets, they said, the prophets are people for the masses. They speak in language for, for the Bedouins and the backward people, telling them of the day of judgment, telling them of this and that. The masses need to hear this to believe it. The philosophers, they speak to the elite. They speak in intelligent language. They speak to those of understanding. And therefore they speak more truths than the prophets do. The prophets speak in vague couch terminology for the masses to be better people. But what they're saying is not really true because the prophets, they know according to the philosophers that there is no day of judgment. But they want the people to be more pious. So they have this concept in order for the people to be better. The ends justify the means for the philosophers. So this was one group of people. Is that they took Aristotelian philosophy, Greek philosophy, and they swallowed it hook, line and sinker, everything. Another group of people were more moderate. And they looked into Greek philosophy and they picked and chose certain aspects and they rejected others. And so they thought what we'll do is we'll take the best of Greek philosophy and the best of the Quran and we will come forth with a new theology, a new aqidah based on this and that. We'll take the best of this and the best of that and we will form something which is better than what the Muslim philosophers were and better than what the Greek philosophers were. Because we're based upon the Quran and based upon Aristotelian philosophy and logic. And this group primarily is manifested in a group called the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila were an extremely heretical group and, and that is why they don't exist anymore. They were so extreme that they died out. Nobody persecuted them. Rather, they were the ones who persecuted uh, the, the Sunni Muslims. If you know this, the incident of Imam Ahmad, for example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Khalifa of the time had become a Mu'tazilite and he had the Imam Ahmad imprisoned because of his theology, not because of a crime. Not because of something he had done to the state, nothing. Because Imam Ahmad believed in the Quran and the Sunnah, he was imprisoned, tortured, whipped, almost to death. And the Khalifa prohibited him from speaking and talking and having halaqahs and durus. And these were the free thinkers, the Mu'tazilites to this day, uh, they are called the free thinkers of Islam. In reality, they were the most narrow-minded because they did not, could not allow other voices to be heard. And they had to force their opinions upon other people. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't stand against orthodoxy as it was. And so eventually they died out. They don't exist anymore as a viable uh, real group. And so what they tried to do is they tried to, as we said, combine between Aristotelian philosophy on the one hand and Quranic principles on the other. And of the theology they had was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be characterized by any attribute. He cannot actually be merciful or all hearing or all seeing because they said now this is very deep here I'm not going to go too deep into it they said if we were to affirm another attribute along with Allah we're actually affirming two beings that have lived eternally Allah and this attribute of mercy therefore there are two gods and not one and if we were to affirm three attributes we're affirming three eternal beings therefore there must be three gods and not one so according to the Mu'tazilites it was not allowed to affirm any attribute to God. God had to be attribute-less, no attributes. He was perfect unity. That's what God is. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They called him Allah. In reality, this is not the Allah of the Quran, obviously. 
Okay. Likewise, when it came to issues of qadr, issues of predestination, they flatly denied it. Flatly. They said, Allah does not know what we're going to do. Allah does not control or create qadr. There is no such thing as qadr. And every single verse and every single hadith, and there are thousands, not hundreds, thousands of them, which are affirms Qadr, they flatly denied it or interpreted it. They said it's not possible that Qadr exists. Even though we as Sunni Muslims believe it is the sixth fundamental of Islam. Our Iman rests upon one of the principles of Iman is Qadr. The Mu'tazila has denied it. And they denied a myriad of other things which we really don't have time to get into. Point is that they thought that by taking the best of both worlds, they'll be able to come out with a unique theology which was better than the two bases that they had come from. The third group of Muslims, the third group of Muslims, the first we said were those who completely took in what the Greek philosophers had to say. The second was those, were those who wanted to merge the two, meld the two, and come out with something they thought was better than the two sources. And the third group of Muslims, now obviously we're being very simplistic because this is not just three distinct groups. You have a spectrum, you have a rainbow. And between the two groups, there are many groups in between as well. Okay, but just to be simple, to, to simplify the, for the lecture, the third group of Muslims, call them Orthodox or Ahl Sunnah or whatever you will, they stubbornly refuse to consider Greek philosophy as a source of theology. They said, and this was their thinking, they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran and sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in order for us to be guided to Jannah. And he did not tell us to turn to other sources. He didn't inform us that guidance will be found in anything other than the Quran and Sunnah. Rather, the Quran and Sunnah tells us over and over again that guidance is exclusively within the message of Islam. As Allah says in the Quran, مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ We haven't left anything out of the book. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا Only by following the Prophet ﷺ will you achieve guidance. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that uh, we have revealed the Quran لِتُنْذِرَ بِهِ So you can warn with the Quran, only with the Quran. So the Quran is telling us, and the Sunnah is telling us, that the religion of Islam is complete, holistic, full. These Muslim orthodoxy, these Muslim jurists, and these are all the ulama that you've heard of, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, the famous scholars of hadith, the famous ulama of fiqh and tafsir, all of these ulama, we conclude them in this orthodoxy. They reasoned, when you have something which is divine, you don't mix it with something which is man-made. When you have something coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has been preserved, protected in the most eloquent language, there's no need to tinker with it. When something is perfect, the Quran and Sunnah, you don't add or subtract from it. When the Prophet ﷺ has been sent with the entire religion of Islam, with the Sirat al-Mustaqim, like he said in one hadith, that I have left you upon the straight path, its night is like its day. No one will deviate from this path except if he wishes destruction for himself. When he has come with this comprehensive, holistic, total religion, why should we give that up and think that guidance will be found, religious guidance will be found in other places? And so they stubbornly clung to the text of the Quran and Sunnah. And they refused to be influenced by foreign theologies, foreign ideologies, cultures that were man-made, and they said, we will stick to the divine and leave that which is man-made. They questioned the Mu'tazilites, they questioned the philosophers, and they said, will you give up that which is better for that which is worse? What is the matter with you? How are you judging? History has told us who the winners were in this battle. History has told us. The philosophers lived, wrote, and died. The Mu'tazilites lived, wrote, and died. Orthodoxy lived, wrote, and died. But the beliefs of only one of these three groups is still living. The beliefs and the methodology of only one of these three broad groups is still alive and healthy. The rest of them, they went up and they went down and they were buried. Janazah was prayed over them. Why? Because even the Muslim masses were able to see through the ridiculousness see through the contradictions in the methodology of both the philosophers and the Mu'tazilites. 
Now, getting back to our topic here, what has this got to do with, with women's rights in Islam? The point I'm trying to stress here is that the stakes have changed, but the game is the same. The tokens have been modified, but the board is exactly the same. No longer do we debate about Qadr. No longer do we question the meaning of Allah's attributes. These are all things. Only the advanced students in graduate school study them anymore, who are specializing in Islamic history and theology. The masses are not debating Qadr. The masses are not debating the nature of God. Once upon a time they did. And in reality, those were far more important topics than the, what they're debating now. But the masses for the most part are not debating God and the angels and the day of judgment and Qadr. No, they're debating now, for example, the role of women in Islam. They're debating now the concept of humanism in Islam. They're, they're debating now, for example, the, the economics of Islam, of the, 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 the hudud or the punishments. And the reason that this topic all of a sudden has become so important is because other cultures have changed their perceptions and their perspectives on these issues. The Muslims for 1400 years have had a steady theology and a steady fiqh. In the sense that our usul is the same, the minor issues of fiqh, they might change from culture to culture, but overall, overall fiqh and usul are immutable. The, the more minor issues, they can change. But for example, the five prayers or the hijab or something as, as, as you know, um, entrenched in our religion as it is, it's not going to change from time to culture. The concept will not change. Perhaps the finer details will. So for 1400 years, we've had the same fiqh and theology. Why is it that for the last 100 years only, the Muslim ummah is interested in these topics? 200, 300, 500, 1000 years ago, you never found any Muslim writing a book called In Defense of Women's Rights in Islam. Okay, Muslim women speak out behind the veil. You never found these books in the marketplace. Why? As we said, this is a counter reaction. This is a counter reaction to events that are taking place outside of our religion, outside of our culture. You see, for over a thousand two hundred years, Muslim women had it much better than their Western counterparts in terms of rights. Much better in terms of marriage and divorce, in terms of money, in terms of transactions, in terms of freedom, a lot of things the Muslim women had it, which their Western counterparts did not have. And you all know, this is the stereotypical, you know, things that all of you know, you all know women over here were not, the, you know, the properties of their husbands completely. And you know, in the, in the, in the past, they were even inherited, like uh, people inherited money, they didn't have the rights to control property, even as, as recent as 18 something, 50 or something, women could not technically own land in certain European countries. Now obviously the Muslim Ummah from day one gave them this right. So for a thousand two hundred years, there was no room for the West to criticize Islam. Their women were behind what the Muslim women were. During the last century and a half, as you all know, Western women have changed their modus operandi, their, their way that they interact with society, with men, with each other. And slowly but surely they began getting more and more rights and privileges and they began asking for more and more of these things that were previously only to men, many of which were Islamic to them from before but Western women did not know that obviously. Until finally not only did they catch up quote unquote with men, but they wanted to go beyond this as well. They wanted to go beyond this as well. And when they went beyond this, I will not call it progression. I don't consider this progression. I call it degeneration. But when they went beyond it, that gave them the luxury for the first time in the history of mankind to look down at their Muslim women counterparts. For a thousand two hundred years, they didn't have that luxury. That possibility could not exist because Muslim women had more rights than them. In the last hundred, hundred fifty years, as we said, and especially in the last few decades, they have not progressed, but degenerated to a level where they think, where they feel superior now. And they say, look at you guys, look at how you keep your women in chadars and in houses and you do this and that and you, you know, and all of these stereotypical accusations they give against Islam. So as a response to this phenomenon, for the first time in the history of the ummah, we have to defend something we never were questioned about. We have to defend how we treat our women. We have to defend the rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger have uh, commanded and given our women. With this prelude to why we're talking about the topic, let me now lead 
into yet another discussion before I give my own response. And let me, uh, and let me ask, why do I believe and why do I state that the traditional stereotypical response will not work? Somebody comes and says, why do women have to wear hijab? Oh, we want women to be appreciated for their inner beauty, not their outer beauty. Okay? This is a correct, I mean, as I'll get, this is correct in and of itself, but it's also incorrect, as I'll, as I'll discuss right now. Why is it a mistake to rely upon these stereotypical responses? I say that such a philosophy, such a methodology is defeatist, is apologetic, is basically having to appease to another culture and group, and you will never win them in this battle. And I say this for a number of reasons. Let me just quote four or five of them. The first reason, when people come and attack us about how we treat women, when people come and attack us about what women have to do and don't have to do in Islam, and we start talking to them about the role of women in Islam, right then and there, we have fallen into a mistake. What mistake is this? The mistake is that we have lost and we have forgotten our job of preaching the religion of Islam. And we get involved in the secondary and tertiary issues of Islam. The religion of Islam is La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. It is Tawheed. It is the concept of Risala, the concept of Nubuwa, the concept of, of Akhira, the concept of these three, the pillars, the Tawheed, Risala and Akhira. This is the religion of Islam. Da'wah is given primarily to these factors. Nobody is going to convert to Islam when he realizes that the inheritance of women is half that of men because of these disease factors. Nobody. And if you find the odd exception, he's the exception that proves the rule. On the other hand, millions if not billions of people will convert to Islam when they hear about the concept of Tawheed. One God, one Creator, worship Him alone. How much more simple do you want it to be? One all-perfect being, why go through anyone else? This is what we have been commanded to do in the Quran and the Sunnah. Call to the fundamentals of faith. Call to our theology. So by getting sidetracked into the economic system of Islam, the role of women in Islam, this and that of Islam, we are actually losing our priorities. We are forgetting our priorities and that is calling them to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let me speak personally as well. Many, many years ago, more than I'd like to mention here, when I was a teenager, I was giving da'wah to a friend of mine in college. Very intelligent, older than me, very intelligent person. And back then, I was still following the stereotypical response system. And so he brought up the same issue as well. Why do your women have to cover? Why can't they go and dress like, like you guys dress? And we were going to school together for like over two, three months. We were carpooling together. And so I had the entire, you know, conversation to myself for days and days and days. And I used it in the tradition, in the, in the stereotypical manner. I gave all of these responses and he brought up the issue of polygamy, the issue of this, the issue of that. And I kept on responding in this traditional stereotypical response. In the end of that three month semester that we had, you know what? His, his name was Mike. Mike agreed with me. And at the end of those three months, he said, you know, I wish all women would wear hijab. I wish all women would act modestly with men. I wish, I wish, I wish. And he agreed with what I was telling him. But you know what? He never became a Muslim. He never became a Muslim because he thought, yeah, you know, that's cool, but you know, so what? Good luck, you know. I didn't approach him. I believe I fell short. I did not approach him with what was far more important than the economic system or the length of the beard or the women's hijab. These are important issues in their own fields. But what is more important is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I feel now in retrospect that had I been talking to him about this fundamental for three months, he would have actually accepted Islam because he was open-minded and he was searching for the truth. But I concentrated my entire three-month opportunity on the role of women in Islam. And I convinced him of that particular role, but not of Islam. Not of Islam. Because even he realized that the religion of Islam, this is just one facet, one act, one, one bit of it. It's not the entire thing. And so he moved on with his life. Secondly, why we will not win in this game is because I believe that other people have invented this game. They're the ones who called it, you know, women's roles or women's oppression. They're the ones who have their own rules. They're the ones who devised the system. 
And I believe that if we leave our rules and our system and try to fight them at their game using their tools, we're not going to be successful. Let me give you some examples for this. For example, for us as Muslims, who decides what is good or bad? Who decides what is inherently evil and inherently good? In philosophy, it's a common question. What is truth? Is truth relative? Well, as Muslims, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a fitrah and has sent down a revelation. And these two put together tell us what is right and wrong. Allah says in the Quran, يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ المنكر. Allah commands that which is good and forbids that which is evil. So the religion of Islam commands what is good and prohibits what is evil. You want to know what's right and wrong? Look at the Sharia. And if you have a pure fitrah, you will see this is good and this is bad, as the Sharia tells you. With regards to our Western counterparts, for them, truth, good, evil, bad, all of these change from time to time and place to place. They don't have a measuring yardstick, a ruler. No. It is difficult to imagine that even as recently as a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, no respectable woman in this country would leave her house without a scarf, a bonnet, a hat on her head. Little house on the prairie, remember that? It is difficult to imagine a hundred years ago that a woman would leave her house without her hair covered. In this country, I'm not talking about Muslim countries of course, in this country. It is difficult to conceive that even two generations ago, premarital sex was taboo. Taboo, nobody. And if they did, they were very ashamed and embarrassed about it. It, was, it wasn't rampant in culture. In our times, it's estimated what 60-70% of, of high school kids are engaged in, in acts of, of, of sexual nature. 60 to 70% of 17-18 year olds statistic. Two generations ago, it was unheard of. One generation ago, single parents, a woman having a child outside of, of, of marriage, was looked down upon so evilly, so vilely, that no respectable woman would possibly dare have a child without being married. In our times, it's no big deal. In our own generations, for those who are slightly older, maybe in the high 20s or early 30s, maybe not that old, I keep on being reminded of how old I myself am by these things. For those who have been around for a little bit longer than those who are 18 or 19, look at how this own society and culture has evolved in the way it looks at homosexuals. In our own time, I remember as a kid in the 80s, which gives you an idea how old I was, growing up in the 80s I grew up, okay? I remember how homosexuals were looked down upon and the names that were given to these people and how disgusted the average masses were with that segment of society. Now look, now look at how we have regressed, not progressed, where it is impossible Forget a Muslim, even a Christian or a Jew cannot stand up in public in front of a non-Muslim audience and speak against homosexuality. He's a homophobe. He's an evil person. How dare he preaches hatred against this, this group of people. A group of people, by the way, who were punished, the likes of which no other nation has been punished. From the time of Adam until the day of judgment, no community, no group of people have been punished like the people of Luth had been punished. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala picked up their city. He picked it up by the angel Jibreel alayhi salam. And he let it swoon up into the air. And he turned it upside down. And he smashed it upon itself. And to this day, to this day, the most uninhabitable place and the most evil water in the face of this earth is the Dead Sea, which is the place of Sodom and Gomorrah. To this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not punish any nation like He punished them. What are we going to do when we're facing a nation who keeps on changing its values? One day something is good, tomorrow it's not good. How are you going to defend? How are you going to say hijab is good or bad when they themselves don't have a steady command of what is good and bad. When good and evil evolves within their own society and culture. You can't. You simply cannot play the rule according to their games. You cannot do it. So I think this is one point. Another point, the issue of freedom of choice. For Muslims, who has the right to tell us? Who has the right to tell me what to do? The answer is very clear. The one who created me, Allah. The only one who has the authority to legislate is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He has complete right to tell me what to do and what not to do. That is the essence of Islam. Islam means what? Submission. 
A Muslim is one who submits. Submits to what? To the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By definition, a Muslim gives up his rights. He says, oh Allah, you created me, you know what's best. You tell me what to do. By definition, for our Western counterparts, who has the right to tell me what to do, what not to do? Nobody. Nobody. I'm a free man. I'm a free woman. I decide what's good for me and what's bad for me. There is no such concept. Western society in our times revolves around the concept of humanism and hedonism, self-pleasure and humanistic philosophies. Again, we don't have time to go into the details of that, but this is the modern religion of the West. It's not even Christianity. They look down at Christianity even, as you know, okay? The modern religions of the West are hedonism and humanism. So for them, there is no concept of there being somebody who has the authority to tell me what to do, what not to do. So how can you argue with them about something being good or bad when they don't believe anyone has the right to tell you what is good or bad. They don't believe in this being who has the right to command you. How then can you justify the commands when they don't believe in the existence of the commander or even the rights of the commander to command? Another issue, the issue of self-worth and self-respect. What makes me respectable as a human being? Well, for the Muslims, the answer is obvious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that in akramakum indallahi atqakum the one who has the most taqwa is the one who is the most noble irrelevant of whether he is male or female no with regards to nobility and being worthwhile and fulfilling my role as a human being the judge the, the judgment is based upon taqwa not upon gender not upon class not upon anything with regards to the western society and culture Self-respect and self-worth is a combination of factors. Your degree, your education, your status, material status, your ability to be promoted in a job, your ability to get the job in the first place. If I can't get this particular job, that means that you're not respecting me to the proper level. If you prohibit me from doing this particular thing that you've allowed to this gender, then I'm not worthy of respect. It's being disrespectful. For us, no, not at all, not at all. Respect is based upon taqwa, not upon gender roles. Honor in the sight of Allah is based upon taqwa, not upon what a man has to do and what a woman has to do. And this goes back, for example, to uh, the concept of equality between men and women. For the Western world, equality means equality in the minutiae of daily life. In terms of work, in terms of job, in terms of this and that. For us, equality is religious and spiritual. There can be no equality in the fiqh, in the, in the roles of men and women, because men and women are not the same. As Allah says in the Quran, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنثَى The male is not like the female. So you cannot compare apples and oranges. You cannot compare two species, if you like, or the same species, but two genders who have different roles. We're different biologically, we're different intellectually, we're different physiologically, we're different emotionally. Don't compare, it's a mistake in the first place to compare. You cannot compare, no. We have certain roles, women have their roles. Neither of these two roles is inherently better or worse than the other. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave men a role that they are more capable of doing. And He gave women a role that they are more capable of doing. Neither of these two roles is looked down upon in Islam. Whereas Western civilization looks down upon many of the things which are inherently women, such as childbearing, such as taking care of children, such as, they call it a derogatory term, housewife. When you say the word housewife, honestly, and I say this with all honesty, most men and women, they feel a bit insulted. Housewife. I'm not a housewife. Where did this insulting feeling come from? It has been ingrained in us because we have grown up in this society and culture. In reality, subhanAllah, my dear sisters, I asked, I talked to you directly. Can there be any job that is more noble in the sight of Allah than taking care of living beings? Can you compare an engineer? Can you compare a, a physicist with a mother? Can you seriously? If you invent an equation or solve a problem, can you compare this with taking care of a beautiful, innocent child that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with? Rearing it, being in charge of it. Why do we look down at these roles? In Islam, the men have been assigned certain roles, the women have been assigned other roles. There is no concept of one being better or worse than the other, no. Because men are different than women. Men are different than women. You cannot compare in a physical way between men and women.
And this is something even in this society and culture, to some extent they have to acknowledge. In the Olympics, you never find men competing with women. Never. I bring up another example. I'm sorry to do so, but again, it's very relevant. When you go to the beach, men are not dressed like the women. Both from the Sharia perspectives are naked, okay? From the Sharia perspective, both are naked. But still, there is a difference between the two. Because even this culture realizes, not that I'm encouraging you to go to the beach, by the way, okay? Because even this culture realizes there are certain inherent differences between men and women. So then if we're not going to compete in the Olympics, why then do we have to compete in the job place? Why? If we're not going to compete in other things, why do we have to compete in things which are exactly of the same world and the same dimension as these things we know we're not going to compete with? The answer to this, it is a fundamental mistake to judge apples and oranges and compare them with one another. Yes, we are twin halves, but we're twin halves who have different distinct spheres. To look down at one sphere or at one role is a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned for the men their role and for the women their role. And this is something which is explicitly mentioned in the Quran. Because of all of these factors, judgment value, self-respect, worth, how do you decide what is good and bad? Because of all of these values, I state very firmly that you will not succeed in arguing women's rights or the economic role or the justice system of Islam because of all of these values. How can you when they're changing their values every day? How can you when they don't have a steady ruler by which they're going to measure something? If something measures three centimeters today, it should measure the same thing tomorrow. So if something is good today, it should be good tomorrow as well according to the Sharia overall. Whereas for Western society and culture, no. What is good today might be evil tomorrow. What is evil today might be good tomorrow. How can you argue with somebody who's changing his rulers all the time? You say something is five centimeters. His five centimeters becomes 10 tomorrow and two the next day. How can you argue and convince him, no, it's five? He doesn't have a steady ruler. He doesn't have a steady base. He doesn't have a steady framework from which, by which he judges and rules what is good and bad. So you're never going to succeed them playing in their game. Another point. There is an inherent inferiority complex associated with this type of mentality. We always have to prove ourselves according to their criterion and custom. We have to prove ourselves according to what they believe is what's right and wrong. And this leads to, for example, to, and I'll be very blunt here, women leading the Jum'ah prayer. Where does this come from? This defeatist apologetic mentality. In the history of the Ummah, we have never had a single group be they Khawarij, be they Qadariya, be they Jabariya, any group from the most radical to the most ultra-orthodox that claimed and said women can lead the Jum'ah prayer. And yet in our times, it has become something which is a media event. People come and take photographs and you know, the, the, the West loves it. Why? Because we're trying to prove our worth according to their scale and that's what's going to happen. The inevitable conclusion, the necessitated natija or result by trying to appease another culture and another civilization is that you are going to change your own values and your own religion in the process. And this is something we see happening around us. They're the ones who have devised this ruler. In order for women to be successful, they must lead the Jum'ah prayer. Subhanallah! Jannah lies under the feet of the mother, not under the feet of the one who leads the Jum'ah prayer. Remember this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned men their role and women their role. You want to be successful? Earn it by pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entering Jannah. You don't have to prove your worth against me, against other men. No, women have their worth in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't judge the worth of women, neither do you judge the worth of men. Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Ya Rasulullah, why does Allah always talk about men in the Quran? Why aren't women mentioned? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed many verses in response to this. Of these verses, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ Whoever does good, whether he is male or female, and he's a mu'min, we are going to give him a good life. Of these verses in the Qur'an, in Allah, uh, um, I don't remember the Arabic right now, if anybody can quote it, uh, it will be good, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not cause to go to waste the ajr of any amongst you, whether he is male or female. Allah will not cause it to go to waste whether that person is male or female. In yet another verse, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ To the end of the verse, believing men and women, pious men and women, fasting men and women, praying men and women, to the end of the verse, all of them will have the reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear sisters, this is equality. If I do a good deed and you do a good deed, Allah will reward both of those good deeds, independent of other factors, same. 
just because I'm a man, I'm not going to get more reward than you. This is real equality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge you based upon your conditions and your ibadah, not based upon your gender. And this is the equality Islam openly promotes. Spiritually, men and women are equal. Fiqhi wise, legal status wise, the rights of society wise, there's no concept of equality. There cannot be. You cannot compare apples with oranges. You cannot compare two beings who are different mentally, intellectually, physiologically, biologically, emotionally. You cannot compare the two. You cannot. I'm never going to be a good mother. My wife will never be a good husband. It's not going to happen. I hope not. You know? <laughs> I hope not. And you know, honestly, let me just go like, you know, anecdotes of my own personal life. I mean, subhanAllah. You know, when my children, it comes to, to dinner time, okay? When my wife goes away and wants me to feed the kids, I give my kids, you know, my kids are still a bit young now. I give them like two, three chances. Come on, beta kalo, do this and that. And I say, you know, try to entice them a little bit, okay? If they don't, once, twice, the third time, I just give up and go back to my work, okay? That's me as a father. My wife sits there, honestly, half an hour, half an hour, coaching them, lovingly feeding them, doing this and that to them. And I look at her and I say, SubhanAllah, look at the love of a mother. I love my kids too, but the love of a mother, there's no comparison. Am I inferior because I can't do that? Well, if you were to judge on the scale of motherhood, of course I'm inferior. But there is no scale. What I'm doing, my wife cannot do. What my wife is doing, I cannot do. Why are we so in obsessed with judging each other based upon our physiological you know, uh, rankings? I can't judge my wife and she can't judge me. She has a certain role and she has created to fit that role perfectly. And I have a certain role and I have been created to fit that role perfectly. It is inherently, fundamentally incorrect to try to compare the two genders in that sense. Spiritually, we are completely equal. Now. To, uh, to, to, to quickly conclude now, I've criticized the standard method, okay, of responding to such allegations. And I believe that they will never be successful, that we're not doing our job properly, that we're dancing to their tune every time they point, you know, once we respond to the women's allegation, they're going to move on to another aspect, economic system of Islam. How come you guys allowed slavery? How come this and that? You're never, you're always going to be dancing to their tune. Every time they, they tell you this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, you keep on trying to prove to them according to their standards it's not bad. In the process, you will not do justice to Islam and you will not be able to prove in their eyes that uh, Islam is as they think it to be. So if this is the incorrect methodology, what then is the correct methodology? Remember, O Muslims, our goal is to convey the message of Islam. It's not to convert the person. If he converts, Alhamdulillah. But our goal is to convey, إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغْ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَاب The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is reminded, your job is al-balagh, announce. وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابِ Leave the reckoning to us. We're going to take care of who believed or who didn't believe. Our job as Muslims is to convey the message of Islam. Therefore, do not be embarrassed about your religion. Do not be wishy-washy about your religion. Be firm. Be steady. Be proud of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you to be. And invite them to the fundamental beliefs of Islam and don't get involved in these secondary and tertiary issues. Remember the example of Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi and the Jew. A Jew came to Salman al-Farisi and he made fun of Islam. He said, has your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught you each and every nitty-gritty of life? Even how to wash yourselves after you, and he used a very vulgar word, which has an English translation, which I won't say here. After you defecate, he used a vulgar word in Arabic, very vulgar word. After you defecate, he even taught you how to wash yourself. This hadith is Sahih Muslim. Salman al-Farsi, how do you think he responded? Well, if he had been in our times influenced by us. Well, you know, modern science has proven that if you sit this way and you do this and you wash with this and... Subhanallah, he jumped straight to the core. He said, Naam, yes. Yes, yes he has. You have a problem with it? Tough luck. But he didn't say that, but I'm saying that, that's what his attitude was. You're the guys who can't even wash themselves properly in the bathroom and you're making fun of us? Okay, again, he didn't say that, but that's the mentality present there. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ taught us how to wash ourselves in the bathroom. He said yes, علمana. he taught us. And he told us to wash with the left hand and to wash at least three times and so on and so forth. Point is, with such frankness and bluntness, the Jew was dumbfounded and he walked away. 
Imagine now if you try to have, you know, explained it in a rational way. Well, you know, there was a research paper recently that if you sit in this way, you know, it's easier in the bowel movements and then this doctor has come to the... You know, subhanAllah, imagine if he had gone into this tangent. Sisters and brothers, you're laughing. I swear by Allah. Think now to this traditional response of how we respond to Muslim women's roles. It's exactly the same. Exactly the same. And I bring it up so that we realize this. It's exactly the same. You come and tell them, well, you know, in, during times of war, you know, there are more men than women. Sorry, there are more women than men, therefore we're allowed polygamy. He'll tell you in our times, there's weapons of mass destruction, which indiscriminately kill men and women. In fact, for the most part, more women die than men. What are you going to do now? Are you going to say, well, in that case, you know, women can have more than one husband? Likewise about hijab. Hijab. They'll come and tell you, for example, that, uh, you know, well, I mean, a hijab, I find it more attractive than the normal woman because that modesty in the wound attracts me. By the way, many Westerners have said this. Many Westerners have said this. That when they see, and by the way, this is human fitra. Modesty, haya, a man finds it attractive in his potential spouse. So something that is fitra, it is in us. Many Westerners have said, you know what? I'm not attracted to these, these women who display their beauty everywhere. I find them cheap. But the Muslim women, when they wear their hijab, they look very beautiful innerly. I mean, that the inner beauty comes out. I'm attracted to that. What are you going to say when you've just told him that the purpose of the hijab is not to attract women? He says, I'm more attracted to the hijab. You're going to say, in that case, don't wear the hijab? Is that what's going to happen now? That's the point. When you try to play the rules by their, the game by their rules, you're not going to come out successful. So the point being, to, to, to basically conclude, the point being, when someone comes and asks you, any question about Islam, which is of the secondary tertiary nature. You respond to him, frankly. You don't have to be wishy-washy and apologetic. If it's something true, you say, well, yes, um, we actually do believe that women have to cover. And the reason for this is because we believe that our God has told us to do so. We believe our God has told us that women have to cover. Let me ask you a question. If you acknowledge the existence of your God, you really and truly believe that that God created you. And then that God told you to pray five times a day, to fast the month of Ramadan, to wear the hijab, to go for hajj, whatever. You believed in your heart after this premise that that particular God spoke with you through the Quran. Would you challenge the authority of the one who created you? And any person who's honest will respond, no, I wouldn't. If I believed that this book is from God, that God actually spoke to this prophet and so on and so forth, I wouldn't question. You say, that's where we stand. We believe that Allah is our God, Muhammad Sallallahu is our Prophet, the Qur'an is the Book of Allah. You want to know why we believe this? Now you start with Tawheed. Now you start with Risala. Now you start with Akhirah. So you move him from his playground into your playground. You move him from his battle into your battle. And you play by your rules. You play by the rules of the Qur'an and Sunnah. You know why I believe that my religion is the only correct religion? Because it makes complete sense. There is one God. He is all perfect. Only He is worthy of worship. He is not like a human. He doesn't come down and crucified on the cross. He doesn't do this and that. He sends prophets because He loves us. And those prophets come with guidance and so on and so forth. You know what I'm saying right now sounds so simple. Do you realize no religion on the face of this earth has such a simple theology? No religion. No religion. Our theology, we take it for granted. Oh Muslims, we underestimate the power of La ilaha illallah. We underestimate the power of La ilaha illallah. Why are you arguing about the economic system and the prohibition of interest and hijab when you have the weapon of La ilaha illallah on your side? How can they possibly argue with La ilaha illallah? How? When you move it into this playground, when you start playing by your rules, wallahi, they have no defense mechanism. You will leave them dumbfounded. When you start explaining to them, the reason I'm like this is because I believe I have a God who created me. I believe that this God knows what's best for me. I believe He revealed the Quran and Sunnah and told me what to do. And then you approach it from that angle. By Allah, how can He attack you? How can He attack you? He can't. You have surrounded yourself by an impenetrable fortress. And your enemy has no fortress at all. The theology of every religion, you can easily critique it and destroy it. So the point is that when people come to you, and bring forth these, you know, um, accusations, whatever it might be, whether it be the hudud, whether it be women's roles, whether it be, you know, the economic system, whatever it might be. If it's true, if it's not true, you, you obviously say, well, this is not a part of Islam. Female genital, genital mutilation is not a part of Islam. Openly, it's not, we don't, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. What's happening in certain countries it completely goes against our sharia. You don't have to defend that, obviously. You shouldn't defend that. But if they come to you with something which is Islamic, then if you be wishy-washy, if you're embarrassed about your own faith, 
if you feel in fear because of the iman Allah gave you, firstly, that's a problem. Secondly, how do you expect izzah to come when you feel already inferior to this person who doesn't believe in Allah and His Messenger? How do you expect Allah to give you izzah? Thirdly, as I said, because he's invented the rules, you're never going to win him at his game. He will always be the winner. Once he finishes this topic, he'll move on to another, and then a third, and then a fourth. And that's exactly what's happening in our times. Fourthly, you have, you have forgotten your entire job of calling to the message of Islam. Now, before I conclude, I'm not saying that you don't mention any wisdoms of the Islamic laws. No, I'm not saying that. Somebody says, why do you have such harsh punishments in Islam? Well, you say, firstly, well, because we believe Islam is a complete way of life and that our Lord has told us what the punishment of stealing of this and this is. Then after you have this impenetrable fortress, then you move on to the secondary issues. We also believe, for example, that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is very beneficial to society. That cutting off the hands of the thieves, for example, and doing this and that. We believe that the one problem that will happen to this person, it will bring about a benefit in an entire nation. And we see statistics to prove it, that Muslim countries that implement the hudud are safer, less rape, less stealing, less this and that, than other countries. I'm not saying don't use that. What I am saying, make sure that's not your primary weapon. Leave it to be your secondary, no problem. And if they attack the secondary, you can always move back to the primary. But the primary shield, the primary response, always has to go back to tawheed, always has to go back to theology. I do this because my Lord told me to. What are you going to do about that? How are you possibly going to argue with that? That is your primary battleground. And I conclude by stating that don't be embarrassed of your religion. Be proud of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. This is a type of pride which is not bad. It is a pride that comes with iman. To be proud of a Muslim, you shouldn't be embarrassed of being a Muslim. You shouldn't have to justify and defend what you know to be true. Be proud. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't be apologetic. And realize that when you approach them in this manner, when you approach them from methodologies and from ideas and from theologies, which they cannot refute, you don't have to worry about be, being on the defensive. Rather, you can go on the offensive and start calling to them to the fundamental of all fundamentals, which is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. I conclude by stating that Islam has been attacked throughout the centuries from many different angles. It's not the first time. It's not the first time there's a clash of civilizations. It's not the first time the two cultures or three cultures have come and there's a tug and war between the, the two. For many Muslims sitting here, they don't know of the previous cultures and clashes. Read Islamic history, read theology, read usul and fiqh and everything. You will understand this is not the first time. And when you understand that and you look at the responses of what happened in the past, apply it to our times as well. And realize that izzah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only comes through iman and taqwa. مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعِزَّةَ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Whoever wishes for honor and glory, let him know that Allah and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of that honor and glory. Islam is the pure religion of Allah. And we have to leave it pure, unadulterated. Something which is divine, we don't mix it with something which is man-made. Something which is perfect in and of itself, we don't need to turn to other ethics, other moral systems, other cultures to try to prove it. We have the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're proud of it and we're never going to apologize about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakal abdi rasulim Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.